check out. Entertainment giants Live Nation and Ticketmaster pledging to give U.S. consumers the ability to see the full price of their tickets up front, so you'll know what you're paying for before you get to the checkout page. This is a, an important start, getting everyone at the table and getting their commitment to provide a better marketplace for consumers, which today is rigged against consumers, is critical. Representatives for major companies, including Live Nation, SeatGeek, Airbnb, TickPick, and others, gathering at the White House Thursday. The announcement, marking Biden's latest effort to address economic issues that are top of mind for voters heading into the 2024 election. This is a win for consumers, in my view, and proof that our crackdown on junk fees has real momentum. The entertainment industry has been under a microscope in recent months, following scenes like this. God, please. There are those who are in the business of grabbing up all the tickets uh, at face value and sending them to a secondary market where there's multiple, multiple uh, costs added. That's what happened in the Taylor Swift situation. While Thursday's announcement may ease the shock factor at the end of your ticket purchase, consumer advocates say the public won't be protected until companies are faced with new laws. The problem is you can disclose uh, everything, all the fees and all the costs, uh, and still take consumers to the cleaners. I'm Gloria Pasmino reporting. Well, Father's Day is coming up on Sunday, and this morning on Sunrise, we are going to celebrate. Yeah, all morning long, we're showing photos of LAX 18 employees and their dads or some employees who are fathers themselves. First up is Cherish Simpson and Aww. her father. We certainly wish him a happy Father's Day and hope you'll join us to celebrate more dads during a brand new half hour of Sunrise straight ahead. LEX 18, streaming local news 24 7. Search for LEX 18 on your device. Count on LEX 18 News. Extension approved. Coming up, details on last night's vote to extend Lexington's urban service boundary. Plus, the latest in Clark County, as the sheriff tells us they expect to file charges in the crash that killed a two year old earlier this week. And we're looking into new numbers from the 2022 overdose fatality report showing a drop in deaths. LEX 18 News at Sunrise continues right now at 5. It is Friday. Thank you so much for sticking with us. I'm Evelyn Schultz. And I'm Sean Moody. Thanks for having me on this edition of yeah, LEX 18 News Sunrise. You. Yeah, lots of coffee this morning <laughs> and wrapping up the work week the right way. We are joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman. Happy Friday, everybody. Yeah, happy Friday. Been a half an hour. I'm going to go back to the break room and make, yeah. make another pot. Yeah. So. I'll put an order in with you, if that's okay. We'll keep you rolling this morning. Uh, we're going to keep the heat and the uh, haze going into the weekend. I'm sure you guys noticed the, mm -hmm. the little bit of hazy sunshine yeah. we were dealing with yesterday. That's a factor again today. It's the smoke from those Canadian wildfires finally wrapping back in again after we were dealing with it last week. Uh, it's become a little bit of a factor, but just more of a, um, you know, hey, check that out as opposed to any kind of major air quality issue or anything like that. Our Lexington Financial Center live camera shows nothing but there's a round of showers and storms that did bypass us to the northeast, moving off through West Virginia, Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio overnight. We had a couple clip far northern Kentucky. There's a cold front that'll settle south. So for this morning, at times, partly sunny skies, and then by later on today, we should end up mostly sunny, but it'll be that hazy sunshine that I've been talking about, still showing an attempt at at least isolated showers up over Ohio today. We're in the 60s, so it's warm out there. As that boundary settles south, it'll kind of keep the temperature in check, so I think we've got a pretty good chance at hitting either side of 80 for the high today, so slightly below normal. Warm and fairly quiet for a few more days, and that better chance for scattered showers and storms late in the weekend, and I'm talking as late as you can get, Sunday night into Monday, so pretty much post Father's Day. And then next week, some decent rain chances, could be more than one, we'll talk about that and see what's up with the next eight days here in just a few. All right, Tom, thank you. Let's get back to the situation we're keeping an eye on here in Lexington. Three people had to go to the hospital after an overnight crash. Uh, yeah, first responders arrived at a scene overnight for an, a crash involving one. This is the scene there right now. This is Manowar Boulevard and Bellawood Drive. We did learn, like Sean mentioned, three people have been taken to the hospital. Police say two of those people have life-threatening injuries. That stretch of Manowar near Bellawood is closed currently. We will keep you updated throughout the morning on air and online at lex18.com. 
There's been a lot of talk in Lexington this year about expanding the urban service boundary, which would extend how much area the city has for developing new homes and infrastructure. Yeah, the idea has been met with a lot of controversy leading up to last night's final vote. LX18's Evan Leak joins us live from downtown Lexington with this continuing coverage. Good morning, Evan. Sean Evelyn, good morning and definitely a lot of discussion and public feedback over the possibility of expanding Lexington's urban service boundary, a possibility that is now a reality as Lexington City Council members decide to approve that vote for that expansion. The first time that's happened in 27 years, a measure that is going along with the Imagine Lexington 2045 initiative goals and objectives for 2023's comprehensive plan on expanding things and just working toward development. According to the Imagine Lexington Comprehensive Plan, more than 5,600 acres of land were identified, which can supposedly house 80,000 more people expected in the next 20 years. But there's also been quite a bit of pushback on the thought of expansion, with many residents concerned about what is really considered affordable housing. A lot of people have come up here, real estate agents and horse farmers. They too have not given an answer as to what affordable housing is going forward i don't want to keep looking back on this particular fight or the, this particular vote i want to look forward to making sure that we continue to create and maintain accountability and guardrails uh, for this expansion so much work has been done but not implemented the we Fayette Alliance years, has been outspoken against expansion after. going into this vote. We'll hear from their executive director, Brittany Rothmeyer, in our next half hour about how she feels with this decision. The boundary opening up between 2,700 and 5,000 acres for some of this development. One of the positives that people have been pointing out, at least the proponents of this expansion, talking about the positives of expanding jobs, creating new jobs for more construction development to go forward here. So we'll see what happens now that this vote has finally gone through. Live in downtown Lexington, Evan Leak, LEX 18 News. Evan, thank you so much. It is 504. The Clark County Sheriff tells LEX 18 they expect to file charges in a crash that killed a two year old boy. Thomas Reed died when the car he was in hit a fence on Lexington Road near Winchester Wednesday morning. Sheriff Burl Perdue says they're waiting on toxicology results and crash reconstruction reports before filing charges. We spoke to Reed's grandmother, who said this loss is devastating. This was totally a major loss that we never ever would have seen coming. Thomas was an amazing child. He loved his Hot Wheels. He loved everybody that he was in contact with. The driver of the car Reed was riding in has not been released from the hospital. The family says they've already seen an outpouring of support from the community who raised money to pay for his funeral. We've got a link to that fundraiser up on lex18.com. It's four years in the making, but finally overdose deaths here in Kentucky are dropping. That's according to the 2022 overdose fatality report released yesterday by state health officials. The report shares statistics about Kentucky's opioid epidemic, including that 2,100 Kentuckians lost their lives to a drug overdose last year. It's a decline of more than 5% compared to 2021. Governor Andy Bashir addressed the new report yesterday during his weekly Team Kentucky update in Frankfurt. Of those deaths, 90% were driven by opioids and fentanyl. Potent, inexpensive methamphetamine continues to be a driving factor as well. Those are tough numbers. Governor adds there is hope through several programs across the state that are dedicated to helping people with addiction. That includes calling 833-8-KY-HELP to find a treatment option near you, or you can head online to findhelpnowky.org. House Oversight Chair James Comer claims President Joe Biden allegedly ran a bribery scheme when he was vice president with his son Hunter and a foreign national. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley this week alleged the foreign national has more than a dozen recordings of conversations with the Bidens. But as Sarah Murray reports, when asked for evidence of any wrongdoing, neither Grassley nor Comer have, as of now, been able to deliver. Senator Grassley. A bold and unsubstantiated claim from a senior Senate Republican. The foreign national who allegedly bribed Joe and Hunter Biden allegedly has audio recordings of his conversation with them. 17 such recordings. 
even prompting members of his own party to pump the brakes. I'm not aware that we have verified that those recordings exist. Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley says a foreign national has audio tapes of Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden related to an alleged bribery scheme involving the foreign national when Biden was vice president. The existence of the tapes allegedly documented in an FBI document known as an FD-1023. These recordings were allegedly kept as a sort of insurance policy for the foreign national in case that he got into a tight spot. Now Grassley tells CNN even he isn't sure if the tapes are real. I just know they exist because of what the report says. Now maybe they don't exist, but how will I know until the FBI tells us, are they showing us our, our work? This as fellow Republicans question the legitimacy of the tapes and the motivations of the foreigner making these salacious claims. I we don't know if they're legit or not, but we know that the foreign national claims he has them. This could be coming from a very corrupt oligarch who could be making this stuff up. The Committee on Oversight and Accountability will come to order. The tapes are the latest unverified allegation Republicans have raised as they investigate the Biden family's business dealings and the work of the FBI. When these allegations came to light under the Trump administration, then Attorney General Bill Barr tapped Pittsburgh U.S. Attorney Scott Brady to look into them. Investigators were unable to corroborate the claims. It was thoroughly checked out by the Trump Justice Department, and they couldn't find anything there. But some of the allegations were passed along to Delaware U.S. Attorney David Weiss, who was overseeing an ongoing criminal investigation into Hunter Biden. It was uh, provided to the ongoing investigation in Delaware. Uh, to follow up on. On Capitol Hill this week, the FBI's deputy director refused to discuss the tapes. Do you have those 17 recordings? I'm not going to comment on any investigative matters, Senator. That was Sarah Murray reporting. The FBI is stressing the document at the center of this all those FD-23s include unverified allegations from FBI informants. In a new statement, a White House spokesperson said, quote, everything in their so-called investigation seems to be mysteriously missing informants, audio tapes, and most importantly of all, any credible evidence, end quote. Well, what happens in Vegas is coming to Lexington. Yesterday, Lexington's Bluegrass Airport welcomed the arrival of Allegiant's inaugural nonstop flight between Lexington and Sin City. Passengers aboard the plane arrived at the airport to a water cannon salute and ribbon cutting ceremony. Leaders say they are thrilled about this opportunity for Kentuckians. Well, we're obviously super excited to have this direct flight. It's been something we've worked with for years. So anytime we get a new direct service, we obviously want to celebrate that. It doesn't mean this will be the last one. We hope to have others in the future. We're always working on destinations for our community, but this was a big one. This new flight will operate on Sundays and Thursdays to celebrate the company is offering one-way fares for as low as $69 for a limited time. It's your chance to go see Elvis in person. Yeah, do you get an Elvis on every flight? Like, like an air marshal or something? That would be well worth the 69 yep. bucks. Just serenade you the whole way yeah. there. <laughs> maybe, cool. maybe not the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got a forecast that's warming up into the weekend. The good news, I think we're going to try to hold that rain off for your Father's Day. Uh, we'll check out when that could kick in coming up. And later on Sunrise film legend Al Pacino is once again ready to tell everybody say hello to my little friend. The actor has welcomed his fourth <laughs> child at the age of 83. Uh, we're going to have more details on the birth when we check out what is trending this morning. Father's Day is coming up on Sunday, and this morning on Sunrise, we are going to celebrate. Yeah, all morning we'll show photos of LEX 18 employees and their dads, or some employees who are fathers themselves. Next up is Brian Neal, our news director, and his son, Jack, who we know is a big LEX 18 fan. He loves local news, so we wish Brian a very happy Father's Day. Welcome back, 513 on your Friday morning. 83-year-old Al Pacino is a father once again after the birth of his fourth child. The boy's name is Roman Pacino. His mother is entertainment industry producer Nora Alfala, who's more than 50 years younger than her Oscar-winning partner. Pacino has three other children with Beverly D'Angelo and Jan Tarrant. Happy Father's yeah, Day! Yeah, happy early Father's Day. Yeah. If, if any of you are watching or celebrating Father's Day over the weekend, we're going to have a good weekend for it, it sounds.
sounds like. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. If you're an 83 year old dad, you need some serious support staff yeah. there. I mean, <laughs> he I'm sure he does, could afford right? it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking, whew. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> happy Father's Day to you if you're celebrating this weekend. S uh, Sunday, we were worried all week mm -hmm. about the possibility of some active weather for Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we've been gradually pushing it off. So now at this point, it's looking like it's mainly going to be Sunday night into Monday. So good news for the dads. but. I don't know if you're going to take that out and hit the links. You may be doing a little sweating because I think we've got a heat spike coming at the end of the weekend. Upper 80s possible. All is quiet right now through our Lexington Financial Center live camera. But we've had a round of showers and thunder showers. You can see a couple of showers still hanging into southern Ohio on the max track. If you put it into motion, uh, there are the storms that went through. There were some severe storms up around northeast Ohio, Cleveland, Akronish. And now as you get into Pennsylvania and West Virginia, they're still strong, but the severe threat has dropped out somewhat. This is the driver behind our forecast today, and it's mainly going to result in a bit of cloud cover, partly sunny skies this morning, and it'll hold our temperatures in check later on today, highs either side of 80. Severe threat continues. They've got severe thunderstorm watches and uh, ongoing severe thunderstorm warnings across the deep south. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every day, the threat pretty much holds steady in that same area. You've got this pretty much stalled frontal boundary that is just making it miserable for folks down south. Uh, you know, severe weather, dangerous severe weather, but also heavy rain and flash flooding potential. Rainfall's all been locked up north, so over the past 24 hours it's been dry. And we are still seeing areas that are running, look at that, 34% Bowling Green, 42% Kneetown of your 30-day percentage of normal rainfall. The only place that's doing better is some of the rain, recent rain that went through. You're running a little bit of a surplus out towards Pikeville, so our precipitation chances pretty much flat for the next couple of days and then next week notice it spikes and then it continues so it could be more than one day's worth of rain which is welcome the cold front drops south today we'll end up with that hazy sunshine we still got some of that canadian wildfire smoke aloft so it's giving us that hazy sunshine uh, but as high pressure builds in pushes east the wind will go out of the northwest today over to the south southwest by late in the weekend That'll ramp up the heat, rise uh, or uh, rise up, or raise up the moisture as well, and eventually we'll start to throw showers and storms into the mix. Heaviest rain the next couple of days, the next few days down across the Gulf Coast. This is mainly going to be early next week. We're showing up to, if not over an inch south and west. That's been pretty consistent. Higher rainfall totals west. A shorter time frame Friday through Sunday shows how dry it's going to be over the weekend. So mainly, this is going to be an issue early next week. 68 degrees in Lexington. And if you want to know where the heat is, it's down south or across the upper Midwest. And there is a pretty significant heat wave ongoing with this big dominant high down over Mexico, but it's mainly for Texas. So there are areas that are hitting triple digits, uh, but it's Texas going back through New Mexico and then pushing up uh, actually in towards Denver, some of those uh, higher temperatures. But the most likely spot to see it Friday, Saturday into Sunday, those triple digit highs down towards south and west Texas. Uh, they just continue to sit and bake with uh, well above normal uh, heat and uh, triple digit highs for some. We'll be right around 80. We're showing upper 70s to low 80s for the temperature range here in the bluegrass today. And that eight-day forecast will show that temperature rise. Mid-80s around normal tomorrow, mostly sunny. Father's Day, upper 80s. Isolated showers and storms possible late, but I think we'll get into those rounds of showers and storms starting early next week and then continuing right on through the middle of it. Welcome back to Sunrise 520 on your Friday morning, and it is time for Consumer Watch. As usual, we begin with a check of the markets. Yes, yeah, stocks gained impressive ground Thursday. Investors appeared to shrug off the Federal Reserve signal it might raise interest rates as soon as July. The central bank opted not to do so at its Wednesday meeting. Thursday's gain saw the S&P 500 hit its highest close in more than a year. Stay tuned for a check of stocks with ties to Central Kentucky coming up around 6.15 this morning. Consumers don't seem ready to slow their spending, despite high interest rates and economic concerns. A Commerce Department report out Thursday shows retail sales were up 0.3% last month. Refinitiv says economists had predicted a decline. The number includes physical stores, online retailers, and restaurants, with numbers adjusted for seasonality, but not for inflation. 
The Commerce Department reports increases in all categories except gas stations and miscellaneous stores. Many economists predict spending will slow eventually. They note that the days of pandemic relief and cheap credit are in the past. And of course, the student loan payment pause is winding down. In Los Angeles, several hundred custodial workers joined riders on the picket line outside Sony Pictures and Amazon Studios on Thursday. Some custodial staff have lost, lost their jobs while productions are halted, and they're not alone. The movie and TV production shutdown is reportedly affecting everybody from local restaurant workers to carpenters who work on sets and truck drivers. The financial losses due to the Writers Guild of America strike are expected to be felt much sooner than the 100-day strike of 2007 to 2008. It is 521 on your Friday. We're going to get a look at the final film of an acting legend nearly a decade after her passing. Plus, explain why it kept getting delayed. And Beyonce impacting the inflation rate in Sweden. Yes, it's a thing. We're going to share a story demonstrating the power of the beehive when we check out what's causing some online chatter this morning. But first, we are continuing our early Father's Day celebrations. Up next, we've got our chief photographer, Brian Stahl, and one of his dogs. That is Newton there in that canoe with him. Good boy, <laughs> Newton. Let's take a look at what is trending on this Friday morning. Netflix is taking its content from the screen to the table. The streaming giants opening up a pop-up restaurant in Los Angeles later this month. Chefs featured on Netflix shows are creating dishes for that restaurant. That includes Chef's Table, Iron Chef, and Is It Cake? Diners can taste their food, but we want, will not be able to meet the chefs themselves. The pop-up is located at a West Hollywood hotel. It'll be open for dinner as well as weekend brunch. We were just chatting during the break. I've never actually watched any of the Netflix cooking shows. Me but neither, but is it cake yeah. sounds appealing to me. Is that where they have something and you... Like they look like real objects, that but they're be. actually cake. Yeah, you see those Instagram videos where someone yeah. cuts into like a garden hose or something. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, no, it's cake. It's actually cake. <laughs> I might check that out yeah. soon. Well, late actress Carrie Fisher's last movie will be in theaters soon. The film Wonder Well will be out June 23rd, more than seven years after Fisher died in 2016 at the age of 60. Mm -hmm. The actress wrapped filming on Wonder Well just weeks before her death. News of the upcoming release comes after the production company Vertical announced it acquired the the rights to distribute the film. The director said the long delay in the film's release was due in part to Fisher's death as well as the pandemic. I'm sure a lot of people will be looking forward to checking that out. Yeah, I mean, they, a couple of movies that she's yeah. been in, I think the last two Star Wars movies came out after she absolutely. died and they were able to, to work her in, get yeah. creative on, on how to do that. So be curious to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When Beyonce performs, the beehive swarms and apparently that can affect entire <laughs> economies. A top analyst says her Renaissance concerts in Sweden in last month altered the country's inflation numbers. Michael Gron is chief economist at a bank in Denmark. He says last month's surge in hotel and restaurant prices in Stockholm keep the country's inflation numbers from falling as much as expected. That has some wondering if other superstars could have the same effect, especially with Bruce Springsteen set to perform there this month. He says probably not. Springsteen might be the boss, but no one rules over inflation quite like Queen B. Imagine being that famous yeah. that you can impact a country's economy. <laughs> it's just, unreal. Just casual. Yeah, yeah, you know, no big deal. <laughs> she's Beyonce, it's whatever, she's yeah. used to it. Well, it is 527, and for the first time in 27 years, Lexington city boundaries will expand despite some concerns over the potential impact. Plus, will our weather conditions be ideal to celebrate Father's Day weekend outside? Tom is back up with answers. We're back in two minutes with a new half hour of Sunrise. Count on LEX 18 News. Coming up, we are live at Manowar and Bellawood Drive on with the latest on an overnight traffic incident. Plus details on the final decision from Lexington City Council as they approve the expansion of the city's urban service boundary. And on Capitol Hill, the Supreme Court cases you need to watch that could see an impact across the country. LAX 18 News at Sunrise continues right now at 530.
Uh, good morning to you. We appreciate you choosing LEX 18 on your Friday morning. I'm Evelyn Schultz. And I'm Sean Moody filling in as we end this work week. Dia Davidson has the morning off, but we are joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman. Happy Friday. Excited to, to see the week get to a close and celebrate the weekend. Yeah, yeah and we're an hour into the sunrise show and your, your caffeine levels still seem to be holding steady. <laughs> it's, it's getting there. Yeah, it's dipping. Just, it's yeah, dipping. Okay. We're going to get there. We're, we're monitoring it throughout the morning. We're going we're to see how Maybe it goes. Maybe an IV yeah. drip. Hey, I'm, I'm on board. Sometimes yeah. on this show you need it. Yeah. Uh, forecast wise for the weekend, we've got good news. Uh, it's going to stay warm and uh, the better news is we need some rain and we've got that within the eight day as well. And the even better news is even though we're going to see it, a lot of it's going to get pushed off until early next week. So right now, nothing to show you precipitation wise until you head up into Ohio. Yes, there was a round of showers, thunder showers that went through. Just barely grazed up around Cincinnati. They had some lone showers pushing through there overnight as expected. We didn't see much. Now there's a cold front dropping south today, so that'll spark a little extra cloud cover this morning. Then eventually as that boundary is out of here later on today, we'll end up with mostly sunny hazy sunshine. Yes, we're still dealing with that haze from those Canadian wildfires. We'll also talk about that. But look how warm it is. It is in the 60s, 67 in Lexington. Our normal low this time of the year is in the low 60s. It's still 70 in Danville. So earlier this week, we had spots down in the uh, mid 40s. So we've definitely warmed up. Now this cold front is going to kind of keep the temperature in check. So it'll hold us upper 70s to low 80s today. But look at the warming trend through the weekend. Around normal mid 80s sunshine on Saturday will shake the haze as the wind shifts and for Father's Day the heat's on. We could run into the upper 80s Sunday with just an isolated shower storm chance late. We'll talk when those chances get much better in your eight day forecast. All right, Tom, thank you. We begin with breaking news here in Lexington. That's where two people have life threatening injuries after a crash. Yeah, it happened just before two this morning at Manowar Boulevard and Bellawood Drive. It involved one vehicle. Let's go live to that scene right now. Police tell us the vehicle was traveling on the outer loop and crossed over the median to the inner loop. They say it then went off the road, hit a tree, and finally stopped in a culvert. Three people were taken to the hospital. The crash reconstruction unit is out on the scene investigating. That stretch of man of war will be closed down for a time this morning. We will continue to track that and keep you updated throughout the morning on air and online at lex18.com. A final decision is reached on the possible expansion of Lexington's urban service boundary. That's the dividing line between land used for home and community development and the protected horse land in our city. There's been a lot of discussion, public feedback and controversy surrounding possible expansion leading into last night's vote. LEX 18 Evan Leak is live in downtown Lexington. He joins us now with this continuing coverage. Good morning, Evan. Sean, Evelyn, good morning, and you're right. A lot of talks that have happened throughout the entire year and some public contention and some concerns revolving around the possibility of expanding the urban service boundary. But despite those concerns, Lexington City Council approved the measure last night to expand the boundary line. The first time we've seen this in 27 years. This resolution going along with the Imagine Lexington 2045 initiative. It's part of the city's goals and objectives for this comprehensive plan for this year. According to the Imagine Lexington comprehensive plan, more than 5,600 acres of land were identified to be used to house 80,000 more people that are expected in the next 20 years. Like we've said, some concerns coming from residents leading into all of this about how affordable this affordable housing will be and the impact it could have on Lexington's identity as the horse capital of the world. The Fayette Alliance has been outspoken against this idea of expanding the boundary. Here's their executive director, Brittany Rothmeyer, giving her thoughts and hopes moving forward with this decision. So much work has been done, but not implemented. We hope in 27 years we aren't back in the same place after a vote for expansion, talking about affordable housing that hasn't been built, about housing prices that never went down, about the ag businesses that fuel our economy and anchor our identity, but were driven away from the horse capital of the world because of urban sprawl, or that ultimately it's cost the community far more than any benefits we've received. The boundary is going to be opening up anywhere between 2,700 and 5,000 acres. For some of this development, Vice Mayor Dan Wu uh, talking after the vote last night and saying rather than focusing on this particular vote and some of the contention concerns, kind of the fight circling around it, he hopes that people are going to be looking forward as we do look forward to expansion and the continued development of our community. 
Live in downtown Lexington, Evan Leak, LEX 18 News. Appreciate that report, Evan. Thank you so much. Time for a check of your top stories. Authorities in southern Ohio are investigating after a shooting left three children dead and a woman wounded on Thursday. The Claremont County Sheriff's Office said all three gunshot victims, ages three, four, and seven, died on scene. They found a fourth gunshot victim outside the home. She had what appeared to be a single gunshot wound to her hand. Officials said that's not life threatening. The father of the three children has been detained. UK Healthcare says Good Samaritan Hospital will be closed by the year 2029. They plan to move the beds and employees at Good Sam into a planned expansion of Chandler Hospital. They also said this is part of the overall plan to improve facilities and ensure quality care. That includes the planning and design for other building projects over the next several years. Good Samaritan was founded all the way back in 1888 and was purchased by UK in 2007. The state Supreme Court says a former prosecutor recently impeached by state lawmakers can practice law once again in our state. Ronnie Goldie was convicted at his impeachment trial of crossing the line with a defendant by asking for nude pictures from the woman in exchange for favors in court. The Kentucky bar suspended Goldie, but he argued his punishment was harsher than attorneys who had done similar things. A 13th horse has died at Churchill Downs. It happened back in mid-May, but we're just learning about it now after the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission published its review this week about the horse's death. The four-year-old was injured while racing during the track spring meet. The colt was put down two days later due to what veterinarians described as an unusual fracture in his left forelimb. 13 horses have died at the track since early May. Kentucky's Horse Racing Commission is looking for a fresh set of eyes as they want to hire a new safety steward. The new position will do things already being done by commission staff, but with an added focus on the state safety rules and compliance among Kentucky's horse trainers and owners. The new position comes amid the added scrutiny at Churchill Downs after the string of horse deaths we've been talking about. The track has moved its races to Ellis Park for the rest of the meet. 537 now, student loan forgiveness, LGBTQ rights, and affirmative action. And those are just some of the major issues awaiting decisions this term from the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices have a self-imposed deadline of early July to issue opinions in those cases, potentially affecting the lives of millions of Americans. Mike Valerio takes us through what you need to know as the 6-3 conservative court could be poised to set new precedents. The decisions could be consequential for students, schools, and businesses nationwide. Among the issues set to be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, whether people like Cody Hunanian can have thousands of dollars in federal student loans forgiven, thanks to a Biden administration program now on hold as it's challenged by several Republican-led states. All of a sudden, kind of right in front of me again, because I'm thinking about the kind of debt I have and I need to finance my future and get a home. Opponents say the Department of Education doesn't have the authority to forgive the loans. Observers also point out um, it's going to be a burden on current taxpayers. In a challenge to LGBTQ rights, graphic designer Lori Smith from Colorado creates wedding websites, but she doesn't want to work with gay couples citing religious objections to same-sex marriage. Colorado is trying to force me to create custom, unique artwork to promote ideas inconsistent with my faith and the core of who I am. There's a critical principle in this case. You can't define your service, so you exclude an entire category of people. Then there are two cases that could shape whether affirmative action remains in higher education. So the Supreme Court is looking at whether or not public universities can use race as a factor in admissions, and that case comes from the University of North Carolina, looking at the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. They're also looking at whether or not private colleges can use race as a factor in admissions. That case comes from Harvard, and the analysis is under the Civil Rights Act. Mike Valerio, LEX 18 News. Meanwhile, Kentucky's Mitch McConnell is slamming the Biden student loan forgiveness program ahead of that potential SCOTUS ruling. And during comments on Capitol Hill yesterday, he cited a former top Obama administration economist who says across the board, student loan forgiveness is, quote, regressive. A Denver police officer has a limb threatening injury after getting run over during the Nuggets victory parade on Thursday. The police chief says he's a sergeant with the SWAT division who was trying to protect fans who had moved barriers. The chief says the man stepped too close to a fire truck and then it rolled over his left leg. 
Meanwhile, police say a shooting happened after the parade during a Nuggets celebration at a nearby park. Two victims had to go to the hospital with gunshot wounds. They're in serious condition. They say the suspect appears to have targeted those victims. 540 now. Ever wanted to visit the iconic coffee shop from Friends? I'll take some this morning for <laughs> sure. You, you will soon have that chance, but Central Perk won't be located in New York City like the one Rachel, Monica, Phoebe, Ross, Chandler, and Joey frequented. Central Perk Coffee Company is opening up in Boston. The permanent location, inspired by the legendary sitcom, will open later this year. It'll look like the show set within a modern, fully functioning coffee house. Looks pretty cool. I'm going to ruffle some feathers with my next statement, though. I've never seen an episode of Friends. Not one. Not Well, maybe like a scene or two, but yeah. maybe I need to watch an episode you got so, some that homework. I could, so that I can go check that coffee shop <laughs> Probably out. going to be lots of fights over that couch right there. Yeah. yeah. The central uh, spot to sit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a pretty good looking forecast on the way for the weekend. Father's Day, we could have some heat building. We'll talk about our next shower and storm chance as well. And later on Sunrise, Kentucky's amateur new champion is crowned in your Sunrise Sports. Eli Gain joins us with a recap of the close finish in the final round at Kearney Hill Golf Links. But before we go to break, checking lottery jackpots. Tonight's Kentucky Mega Millions jackpot amount is $281 million. Tomorrow's Kentucky Powerball jackpot is $366 million. And before we go to break, we are continuing our Father's Day celebration. Yeah, here is a photo of photojournalist Pamela West. French and her father. And we have another photo to share of one of our digital producers. That's Christina Rosen and her dad. Happy Father's Day, everybody. So I've been here for 25 years. I had no clue it existed. If this is how it's going to be from now on, I'm sending Portnoy the bill for my medical bills because <laughs> I'm going to have a heart attack. A small pizza joint found out just how powerful online reviews can be. The little rendezvous mom and pop pizza place in Meriden, Connecticut, shut down early Wednesday because the shop was so inundated with customers it actually ran out of dough. That's a good problem to have. The crowd showed up one day after a popular sports and pop culture blog, Barstool Sports, gave the little hole in the wall one of the highest scores ever in pizza reviews on the site, a 9.1. The owner says what sets this pizza place apart from others is its 135 year old pizza oven. The good news is they've restocked and they reopened for business on Thursday. So far, no heart attack and a lot of happy customers with full bellies. That looks really good right yeah. about now. <laughs> uh, you know, work in the morning shift, you end up with weird food cravings yeah. at weird hours. I, I'm ready for like a 6 a.m. pizza slice yeah. at this point. We, we should order one. Yeah, I've seen that guy's reviews. It's yeah. pretty funny. He just walks out and he's got one in his hand. And he's just talking about the pizza. But uh, yeah, I think, he's, I think he's done a couple around here. Yeah. As I think well. he has. Yeah, I remember the Goodfellas one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, as far as the, the weekend forecast is concerned, I've got good news. Uh, we've got uh, warmth. We've got sunshine. Hazy. I'll explain that. And uh, the better news is the Shower and storm chance, which we really could use. We're pushing it off until late in the weekend, more than likely early next week. This is what it looks like outside right now. The max track shows there are showers and storms up north and east. This is the batch that bypassed us to the northeast across Ohio, moving into Pennsylvania and West Virginia this morning. What will pass through here is this cold front, though, and as this boundary slides south, it's going to keep this northwest flow in, and it's also going to keep the temperature in check. But that northwest flow, we're going to come back to that, is an important aspect in the forecast today as well. This is an important aspect for the deep south, the stalled frontal boundary. And once again, another day of severe weather for them. Uh, they've been taking multiple hits over a number of days. And rainfall wise, it's all stayed north. So we haven't picked much of anything up. We continue to dry out. We're running fractions of what we would normally see over the past 30 days and our precipitation chance is pretty much nil until Monday. The important thing about the precipitation chance next week is it is more than one day. So we are going to see multiple days worth of rain chances. But in the short term, that front slide southeast will end up mostly sunny later on today, mostly sunny tomorrow mostly to partly sunny by Father's Day. And then here comes this ridge of high pressure. So as it moves in Saturday and starts to slide east, our wind will gradually go more east to southeasterly and then become southwesterly by the end of the weekend, which means a couple of things, a number of things, actually. The haze from the wildfire smoke that I'm about to talk about, that goes away. Moisture rises, so we'll see a rising chance for some of what's out west by Sunday night. And in addition to that, we will see the temperature rising. We've got a little heat spike coming our way for Father's Day. Potential rainfall Friday through Tuesday. This is all confined to starting Sunday night. 
and uh, into Monday and Tuesday. We're showing still quarter half inch northeast up to if not over an inch southwest. So it could be a good soaking for us. We need way more than that for the ongoing drought, though. It's 68 in Lexington and our highs are going to be bumping around the 80s. Here's that heat spike upper 80s by Father's Day. The reason I was talking about that northwest wind is because of that wildfire smoke. You may have think the you may think those Canadian wildfires just went out. They're gone. They've gone away. No, the wind just shifted, so we haven't been impacted by it. Well, low pressure is set up to our northeast again, so the flow around that out of the northwest is ushering some of the smoke in. It's much more prevalent across the upper Midwest, back into the Dakotas. But you'll see it. You saw it yesterday. There's that hazy cast of the sunshine, and that's going to continue again today. But eventually, as the upper low slides east, we start to see this ridging building in. We'll heat up, and as the wind shifts, we'll start to scour some of that smoke out of here. So we'll have some pretty significant changes by the end of the weekend. You can see that heat building, and uh, well, just in the short run right there, 80 today, mid-80s tomorrow, upper 80s. Some of our southern counties may push 90 degrees by Father's Day. But for today, just get ready for more hazy sunshine. We'll likely stay on either side of 80 degrees for the high in most places, breaking down your afternoon today. If we break down Saturday as the wind starts to shift, there'll probably still be some lingering haze, but I think overall mostly sunny highs right around normal in the mid 80s. Saturday could be one of the better days of the weekend. By Sunday, Father's Day, the heat jumps, the clouds build. We'll have a low end chance for isolated showers and storms and then see that short shower and storm chance ramping up next week. Final round of the Kentucky Amateur Championship took place yesterday at Kearney Hill. Justin Tereshko, that's the EKU Golf Coast, also a Transylvania alum. Eagle attempt here on 18. We had a three-way tie at eight under. Just misses, but that's an easy tap in. Goes to nine under and was your outright leader. Now, University of Kentucky's Campbell Kramer needed this birdie to become co-leader and force a playoff, but that is a long putt. He would par that hole. He tied for second with Jackson Finney at eight under. So Justin Tereshko, representing EKU in Transylvania, wins the Kentucky Amateur Championship at nine under par. I knew that Campbell still had a putt and he had to make it. I know it was a long putt, but in 2018, I lost in a playoff because a former Kentucky golfer made a putt of a similar length to time me. So the entire time I just thought his putt was going in. And then it was, you know, and then it was more relief as soon as it, and then, you know, smiling and realizing that I just wanted to stay down. And it gives me confidence that, you know, I can play solid golf for three rounds. And, but I mean, last year I kind of blew it and had a two shot lead and last year back nine and then this year I have a two shot lead. So it kind of stings a little bit, but I mean, it's disappointing, but I mean, I, there's some positives out of it. And some history at the U.S. Open yesterday. For the first time in the majors history, a player has carded a 62 in a single round. As a matter of fact, two players did it. Ricky Fowler and Xander Shoffley, each shooting eight under in the opening round of the U.S. Open. That's on the West Coast in Los Angeles. They were both in the span of three groups as well. Fowler poured in 10 birdies on the round, had two bogeys. Shoffley carded eight birdies and no bogeys. This was actually a pretty low scoring day overall at the Los Angeles Country Club. So expect some changes to be made throughout the forthcoming days to make the course a little more challenging. As you take a look at the leaderboard after the first round, tons of low scores. As I mentioned, Fowler and Shoffley on top, Wyndham Clark and Dustin Johnson at six under. Johnson was on pace for a 62, but a bogey on his final hole gives him a 64. Brian Hartman and Rory McIlroy tied for fifth at five under, then a handful of guys there at three under, including Bryson DeChambeau and Scotty Scheffler. Well, the other night we found out who Kentucky football will be playing within the conference in 2024. A couple of substitutions of teams. The Cats not playing Mizzou for the first time since 2012 or Mississippi State for the first time since 1990. But those matchups were placed with some pretty good ones as you take a look at the home and away games. Auburn, Georgia, South Carolina, and Vanderbilt will be coming to Lexington to play the Cats at Kroger Field. While the Cats and Big Blue Nation will go on the road to Florida, Ole Miss, Tennessee, and new kid on the block, Texas. More football news. C.J. Conrad is heading to Richmond to join Walt Wells and Eastern Kentucky's staff as the Colonel's tight ends coach. Of course, Conrad played at Kentucky, was a tight end here from 2015 to 2018. And since then, 
he stayed with the Cats, working as a grad assistant and a quality control coach while earning his master's in sport leadership from UK. For 18 Sunrise Sports, I'm Eli Gain. Enjoy your weekend. watching LEX 18 News at Sunrise. It is 556. You might think of giving refs an earful to complain about their officiating, but that's not what happened at the end of the congressional soccer match. Representative Dan Crenshaw gave them an eye, literally. Jeannie Mose explains. You promise you Forget the line. evil eye or side eye or stink eye. Don't worry, it's nothing too crazy. Republican Congressman Dan Crenshaw gave soccer refs his glass eye. He has 10 or more of them, many adorned with symbols, after the annual congressional soccer match. The Republicans beat the Democrats 4-2. to two. The former Navy SEAL still wasn't happy with the officiating. The refs, uh, they, they have two eyeballs, but they don't use them, so I was going to... There we go. Crenshaw has been described by another Texas politician as a sexy pirate. He lost his right eye in an explosion while serving in Afghanistan and has talked about his glass eye in an eye-opening way. Uh, even if it's a natural looking eye, it doesn't quite look right. And uh, it's, it's extremely distracting and I'm pretty self-conscious about it. So he wears patches in public, proudly sporting a Navy SEAL Trident patch. And he's open to others joking about patches. For instance, the Apple eye patch. When SNL's Pete Davidson mocked Crenshaw's eye patch, the congressman came on to joke back. He looks like a troll doll with a tapeworm. <laughs> and now he's trolling the referees that when the joke was over, hey. He reached in and took his glass eye back. Don't worry, you can clean them with baby shampoo or hard contact lens cleaner. By plucking his out, Crenshaw put the eye in. Ay, ay, ay. Genie Mose, CNN, New York. A good sense of humor. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before we go to break, we want to continue our Father's Day celebration. Yeah, here's a photo of Sunrise producer Cheyenne Miller and his dad. Love that photo, Cheyenne. Happy Father's Day to everybody. We'll continue our celebrations coming up next. LEX 18, streaming local news 24 7. Search for LEX 18 on your device. The We've got a warm start to the weekend, and it's going to be another hazy day. You probably noticed that yesterday. Some of that wildfire smoke is uh, out there again, and we're going to talk about that. But the good news is at least it's a dry and quiet start. And if we look all the way out to Sunday, your Father's Day forecast, it's going to be a hot one, and we'll have increasing clouds by later in the day. And that hot one, that high in the upper 80s, will probably come sometime between noon and 5 p.m. We'll see that peak heat into the uh, early to mid-afternoon. But it looks like at this point we should be able to keep it dry. We will see a rising chance for showers and storms late in the weekend, early next week, Sunday night into Monday. For right now, since we're just getting the weekend started, here's what's going on. Low pressure up across the uh, northeastern Ohio and western PA region. Uh, that has sparked a round of showers and storms that pretty much bypassed us to the north. We have a cold front dropping south. That ongoing severe threat continues. They just continue to get hammered with tornadoes and damaging wind and flash flooding down to the south. We have been caught in between systems, these northern stream systems and these southern stream systems, and there just hasn't been a lot of active weather. Precipitation, 24 hours, zip here. So we're running an almost inch and a half deficit for the month, for the year, over a three and a half inch deficit. And uh, it is, of course, resulting in ongoing drought conditions. The drought update from Thursday morning shows that moderate drought has expanded slightly. It went from 25% uh, across the Commonwealth to 30% coverage, and then rest abnormally dry. The only pocket that's not in drought out into eastern Kentucky where you guys have had a little more beneficial rainfall there. And our rainfall stays pretty much flatlined until you get to next week. So we've got a dry weekend ahead. 
Cold front drops south. What it'll really serve to do is keep the temperature in check. Hold us around 80 today. And then uh, tomorrow, mostly sunny skies. By Sunday, Father's Day, as high pressure slides east, we'll start to ramp up the heat and the humidity a little bit and eventually start to throw some of this into the mix. Showers and storms approaching from out west. that will get in here early next week. So rainfall wise, this shows Friday through Tuesday. But we're primarily talking Sunday night through Tuesday, anywhere from a quarter, half inch up to an inch or more. That's held pretty steady the last couple of days, so hopefully we'll get some good rain out of it. But again, it's still days away. More dry days ahead to add to the drought. It's 66 now. Our highs are going to spike in the upper 80s Sunday and then drop back down to the low 80s early next week. And the reason we're still dealing with that wildfire smoke is those wildfires have not gone away. The wind just shifted and shifted the smoke away from us. Now, with that low up over northeastern Ohio, I was telling you about it. We've got that wraparound effect. They've had big issues last couple of days with even air quality and haze up across the upper Midwest. Well, some of that's wrapping through here, and you can see it as you're driving around. It's mostly sunny, but you've just got that uh, little bit of haze that is apparent. Well, eventually that low is going to pull out. You're looking at the upper level winds. We're going to have upper level ridging building in. So we'll start to see the heat build. The winds will shift. The haze will go away. The temperature starts to rise. And then eventually we're going to throw some active weather into the mix. Just not today. Hazy and warm highs either side of 80 degrees. It's going to be a pretty nice Friday. And Saturday, we'll hit right around our normal high, mid-80s. And as the wind slowly shifts, we'll start to shake the haze. We'll have a little brighter sunshine there. And then Father's Day, I think for the most part, we'll keep it dry, but have that spike in the upper 80s before we get that active weather on and off much of next week. All right, Tom, thank you. Time for a check of your top story, 616 on your Friday morning. A small Texas town is in recovery mode after a deadly tornado ripped through parts of the state. The twister hit a city called Perryton on Thursday afternoon. It killed at least three people and injured dozens more. That storm also caused widespread damage and knocked out power across the entire town. An Air National Guardsman has been federally indicted for allegedly leaking government secrets. Jack Teixeira faces six felony charges. He was arrested in April for sharing classified documents online. The breach exposed sensitive information about the war in Ukraine, military capabil capabilities of U.S. allies and adversaries, and other national security issues. The country's top diplomat is heading to China. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will meet with Chinese officials in Beijing this weekend to discuss several issues. Today's meeting could pave the way for additional meetings, including one between President Joe Biden and the Chinese president. Now, here's a look at yesterday's closing price of stocks with ties to Central Kentucky. Not a bad day on Wall Street as all stocks with local ties closed in the green with the exception of Valvoline. We are back after this. watching LEX 18 News at Sunrise. So many people can relate to this. One of the big travel fears is losing a piece of luggage on the way to your destination. Yeah, so many people are using small trackers like the Apple AirTag to keep a watchful eye on their luggage, but do they help? Consumer reporter John Matteris looks at some of the concerns you might have about luggage trackers so you don't waste your money. Air travel can be as unpredictable as the weather, and that's why more and more travelers these days are using air tags to track down and locate missing luggage. So many suitcases, so many chances for yours to get lost. I even put it in my carry-on bag because you never know when the airline's going to make you gate check your bag. Summer Hall with the Point Sky says Apple Air Tags or similar devices are well worth the $25 to $30 cost to help you locate a purse or piece of luggage. Joe Williams says he never travels without a tracker these days. This trip we checked a bag and it had to make a connection, so you want to know exactly where it's at. He and his wife use a tile where they can see their bag's location right on their phones. Like knowing where it is. With any tracker, Summer says don't expect a 100% success rate. What I've found is that sort of in the bowels of the airport, it's not fabulous at where exactly it is, in part because it relies on cell phones around it to sort of give you its location. There are also ongoing safety concerns. Apple and Google recently announced a partnership to address unwanted 
tracking after several reports of harassment. They can be very easily slipped into something. PC Mag Chandra Steele reminds us the issue isn't with using location trackers for yourself. They become problematic if someone else puts a tracker in your belongings, so stay vigilant. Apple and Google are proposing new standards to alert users to an unknown Bluetooth tracker, no matter the type of phone they use. Other companies such as Samsung and Tile have expressed their support. Joe Williams as a tracker makes checking bags a lot less stressful. It's one of those things where it's just a fail safe. And that way you don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris. Here's a quick check of those lottery jackpots as we go to break. Tonight's Kentucky Mega Millions jackpot, $281 million. Tomorrow's Kentucky Powerball jackpot, $366 million. This morning we're having a little bit of an early Father's Day celebration. Love those smiles. Up next we have Sunrise photojournalist Alex Barber and one of his sons, Braxton. Happy Father's Day, Alex. You're watching LEX 18 News at Sunrise. 624 now on your Friday morning. Two deaf American mountain climbers are the first to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Here's Anna Corin with their amazing story. This is the moment Scott Lehman and Shana Unger reached the top of the tallest peak on the planet. In doing so, they became the first deaf Americans to summit Mount Everest. Shana also made history as the first deaf woman in the world to successfully complete the climb. When we got to the top, we felt like we defeated all the odds. We were really proud of ourselves. It proves that with the right attitude and the right adjustments, that space is available for deaf and hard of hearing people. Unfortunately, their triumph was later tinged with sadness as they learned that Muhammad Hawari Hashim, a deaf climber from Malaysia who they had befriended on the mountain, had gone missing after his successful ascent on May 18th. A search and rescue operation has failed to find him. While summiting Everest is an impressive achievement in itself, Scott and Shana have even loftier ambitions. The couple are aiming to be the first deaf individuals to climb the highest mountain on each continent, known as the Seven Summits. Their Everest expedition puts them over halfway to reaching that goal. We are still processing Everest, but for sure next will be one of the three Seven Summits. Which one, we are not sure. The educators from the Washington DC area were both born profoundly deaf. Due to a lack of accessibility for the deaf community in outdoor education, Scott and Shana learned many of their mountaineering skills from YouTube videos. In turn, they've been sharing their experiences online, documenting everything from life at Everest Base Camp to the specific challenges they've faced on their expeditions. Scott and Shana use social media to explain how they manage logistics on mountain routes and navigate common misconceptions about their abilities as deaf climbers. The duo are committed to making mountain climbing more accessible to people from marginalised communities, especially deaf and hard of hearing youth. I want all kids to dream bigger a mission that will be top of mind when they scale their next summit. Anna Corrin, CNN, Hong Kong. 627 now on your Friday morning. Storm Tracker meteorologist Tom Ackerman is back with what you can expect in your Father's Day weekend forecast, plus a look at how a Kentucky boy won over fans and judges on America's Got Talent. Our final half hour of this morning's LEX 18 News at Sunrise begins after this break, but first, we want to wish an early first Father's Day. This is BBN Tonight executive producer Jesse Riffey with his baby girl. Count on LEX 18 News. Coming up, we are live at Manamore Boulevard with details on an overnight crash that could affect your morning commute. 
Plus, charges are expected to be filed in Clark County after a two-year-old boy died in a crash earlier this week. And the U.S. Secretary of State heads to China for a high-stakes meeting. Why today's meeting comes as tensions continue to build between the two countries. Our 6.30 half hour of LAX 18 News at Sunrise starts right now. Good morning to you. It is 6.30 right on the dot. I'm Evelyn Schultz. And I'm Sean Moody. D.A. Davidson has the morning off. And, of course, we are joined by Storm Trekker meteorologist Tom Ackerman. Hi, Tom. Hey, got a fresh pot of jet fuel. <laughs> <laughs> in the break room, All right. brewed for you, if this is so necessary. I may make a break for it yeah. during your forecast. Don't be um, offended. <laughs> Forecast-wise.